like this I was after for five years. He was just huge, huge, huge. Yeah. One year he'd be forked on one side, one year well, this was him. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so uh, a few years ago I'm sitting in the stand and here he comes like forty yards away and he's rubbing a tree with a rack like that, it was like hundred and six like oh so I got the muzzle I shot and it was kind of behind the hemlock. Well he jumped off, ran off and he wasn't using that leg so he ran off and found some blood couldn't find him I got the dog lady we tracked him around and part, he, he ran we saw him run he ran as fast as a normal deer so he's gonna survive it's not ethical to keep chasing him so that was um the first you know week of November December 5th check my cameras him with that rack is standing there with a leg missing gone really gone he's three-legged it's like what the heck so i showed it on facebook and everyone told me what a jerk i was you know mm. unethical blah 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 yeah, i was the worst guy in the world so then i gotta get pictures of him for the next month you know you know three legs is a rack of source so so i figured the coyotes would get him well august i had to check my camera and boom three-legged deer with that rack so when when you shoot a hit a deer on one side they usually do something funny on the other well this time they did everything but um then i said on facebook i don't think i'm gonna shoot him if i see him because he's almost like a pet i've known him for five years he's probably almost 10 years old and i just oh you're a jerk put him out of his misery he wasn't any misery he was a year later he's like yeah hopping around Doing good. so while well, he walked by me with a doe i shot him yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I always send the teeth in, um, 10 and a half years old. Really? Wow. wow. And I knew he had to be close to that because I was after him for at least five years and he had a rack like that. So, I mean, it takes three or four years to get a rack like that. Right. And my oldest is Vermont deer. I got a 11 and a half year old doe. In wow. My gate. It was just huge. We weighed it. It was light as a feather and it weighed 83 pounds. They said, our scale's broken. I mean, you can't be, well, it was just so over. Yeah. I mean, at its peak, it was probably 130, 140 pounds, but it was just light as a feather, all no skin kidding. and bones. Uh, yeah. And the teeth, I mean, hardly any teeth, but 11 and a half wow. years of, of me chasing it, coyotes, bad winters. Yeah. But uh, a big thing about deer is age. I mean, and I mean, I'm averaging really hot in Vermont, I'm averaging you know, five or six years old for it's all my Vermont bucks. Yeah. yeah. And New Hampshire, um, this was uh, seven and a half. Yeah. That's and I sent the teeth in of the one this year. He's going to be over seven. Similar shape to that one right there, right? He yeah, he's the exact same thing, just 22 inches wide. Oh. <laughs> yeah. What did that deer weigh? 198. Beautiful. Yeah, so. Where was yeah. this deer from? That was Saskatchewan. That's I had to get a That's some cool stuff going on right here. Yeah, the um, acorns. Acorns. Yeah, yeah you, you ripped it during development. This was a uh, white and fresh when I shot him. <clears> big name bean. Yeah, the, the kid broke in that. You know, when we were, but I used to hunt Maine. Then I discovered Saskatchewan. And <laughs> November is just only so long. Yeah. I mean, they should make the month longer. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's okay, Maine, Saskatchewan, Maine, okay. Yeah. So I don't go to Maine anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every year I hunt both states. I live right on the border in North Haverhill. And you go to a deer checking station in Hampshire and there'd be pictures on the wall. There'd be, you know, 30 deer reported and two or three of them are, are 200 pounders. Mm -hmm. Then you go to the Rygate side, you know, on the Vermont side of the river and there'd be twice as many deer and they're almost all spike horns and the occasional 160 pounder. And I always wondered why is that? Um, well, um, I'm a member of QDMA quality deer management and they have a really good magazine, which um, biologists, you know, write the articles and, um, and they were telling about states that have too many does versus bucks. That's, um, that hurts um, the quality of the rack. So in New England, it's tough for a buck to survive in, in, in any state because um, uh, 
they're all they're doing is chasing, chasing, chasing. They're not eating hardly anything. Then you get to December and you get a, a bad winter coming and the biggest bucks are gonna die if you got if they're too stressed. Well, Vermont had twice as many does per square mile than like New Hampshire. So really? so you have the bucks couldn't keep up with the does. They're just chasing, chasing, and they can't keep up. They're just wearing themselves down. They're doing twice the effort. Hmm. And then um, some of the, the deer don't get bred because there's just so many does and not enough bucks. Well, a deer that doesn't get bred in November, she's going to get bred in December, then, then uh, January. Well, that deer is going to be a couple months behind. By the time you get to the fall, this deer just doesn't have, you know, they're going to be behind. They're going to, they're going to be a spike one. Mm -hmm. And most, like a year and a half old deer in New Hampshire, they're commonly six pointers and stuff like that. We get spike horns in Vermont. It's just spike, 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 and spikes. or the little, little point on it. So, uh, and, and this is fact. I'm saying this is the, the biologist. So, I mean, I love hunting Vermont, um, and I always would get my spike horn every year and I always get my doe with a bow. I, I generally would get three deer a year. Then they made the um, antler restrictions. Um, I'm getting 150 to 180 pound deer every year in Vermont now because of the antler restrictions. It's just, it's that made the a biggest difference it, maker for huge you. Huge difference. I mean, I've been hunting since the early 60s. It was never like that. I rarely ever see an eight pointer it just didn't happen yeah, i shot a few eight pointers back then but i'm getting eight pointers every year in, in okay. vermont just sitting mm -hmm. you said your average age in vermont was like five and a half six and a half. Or, more. or more yeah yeah i've got and some some that are nine yeah. so then what i was saying earlier about the soil what are your five and a half six and a half year old bucks in vermont looking compared to your five and a half six and a half year old bucks in new hampshire what's the comparison there What's happened with the antler restrictions, they're a year older, uh, but yep. pardon my French, they have a shit rack still. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just night and day. Um, with our record book in New Hampshire, we, we, we shoot so many big rack bucks. And yeah, Vermont's got their good ones occasionally, but mm. not the it's frequency. not, they're not close to New Hampshire, yeah. not even close there. So, um, so do you think when they get in that older age, the fact that they've been running around chasing more does, that has the impact on their horns as they get older? Or is it more like, is the forage different or is the genetic pool different? Well, what do you think? Is for a hundred years, they've had too many does. Okay. So you can't just snap your finger, okay, right. we're going to shoot more does. It's, 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 it's genetic. Mm -hmm. Even something like, can't be, it's ingrained into them. It, if they even it out for 10 or 20 or 30 years, it, it will get better, but yeah. you can't, it's, it's, it's affected them. And, and one thing I've brought up on a couple podcasts before this is that the white mountains and this whole area is a lot younger than the green mountains. Like, uh, the geologically, gr geologically, like, uh, the green mountains are, I forget the number, but a lot older. So I'm wondering if maybe the nutrients like in the ground is just depleted. I have a Vermont friend that keeps telling me your deer are big because of your soil. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. You don't no. Think so. It's we have the same soil. Really. We have the same trees. Okay. We we've, we've had proper management mm. for a very long time. Um, it's um, the the buck to doe ratio has been good for. Forever. Yep, yeah. So Vermont's improving. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, but it's going to take a while. To it, it would take an too. awful long yeah. time. Yeah. Like a hundred years, or something or like more. that. <laughs> it, it would take a long time. I mean, and people listening will say Roscoe doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> no, but I mean, I've I've lived on the border and I've seen it in the the deer reporting station and and the record book is just. Yeah. There's no denying the facts of it. it well, yeah. my son and I both got 
monsters this year on the same, within a few hundred yards of each other. And there was a 21 pointer shot a mile from there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other, mo this is all in like one town. Mm -hmm. And they're behind every, every other tree. I think in your area, your region of New Hampshire, I think bucks have a lot easier of time getting old just because of the way your woods is too. I think that plays into it. Well, we don't have the harsh winters. No, you don't have the harsh winters. You're very thick, 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 thick woods and a lot of swamps it seems like. So I think that's great habitat for deer to get to age. It seems like a lot of Vermont's just hardwoods. And hard. if you don't cut it, it's just a giant hardwood ridge you know and it's hard for deer to get age when you know they become a three and a half year old six pointer and they're getting smoked at 200 yards in the maples you know so i think uh habitat has a, a lot to do with it too you guys have some phenomenal habitat yeah well as a land surveyor i see a lot of property and some land is just sterile i mean it's big mature trees yeah it's got some big oaks and oh wow look at all the deer tracks i'm gonna sit here well Two in the morning. You know, yeah. Yeah. Deer don't like to get killed, so mm. so I will. I own a lot of land. Um, I'll buy sterile land and I'll turn it into a mecca. And uh, I've built over seventy food plots in Vermont, New Hampshire. Really, really? that's um, impressive. Yeah, I don't own a tractor. Oh, I mean, man. I have a friend that a couple years ago. Oh, I didn't have the time to do my my one food plot i said you don't have time to do one food plot <laughs> so and so f the food plots have um made my deer you know they just they have a lot more food because mm. right now the snow's all melted and you go through the woods and there's no green or anything you go to my food plot where the clover is and this clover popping up already so the dough is eating that clover right now, picking on that. It's making really good milk. And when that fawn is born, that fawn's going to be so much more ahead of the fawn a mile away mm -hmm. that didn't have yeah. instant green. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I, being the QDMA, I, I read a lot on this type of stuff and it, it makes sense. Do you plant turnips? Yeah, I uh, turnips and kale, yeah. and I always have a two-part food plot. Half of it would be clover, which I might get five years out of. Yeah. Then the other part would be an annual for turnips and kale, and I have happy deer. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so um, I, as I said, I have um, a lot of land, big wood lots, and I'll um, make a sanctuary mm. out of big parts of it so the deer aren't bothered. And you know they're happy, and they come up and I just blast them. Do you <laughs> do, you do a good bit of uh, predator control on your in your areas, or um, you try to? Or I may be going out tonight, uh, two nights in a row. They've been at my bait. Okay. So when we're done with this, so I'm you're, you're actually coyote. trying to get them. Yeah. Get them out of I got 15 coyotes last year. 15. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's okay. Huge. So you're doing your part then. That yeah. Is, that's huge. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. I I, more I, I trap. I shoot them during deer season, and I bait and I'll sleep all night and I have a driveway alarm and two in the morning it goes off and I open the window and shoot them. Hey, okay. that's perfect. Hey. Imagine how, how much better it'd be if every licensed hunter, every licensed deer hunter in, in the state would take one coyote a year. Oh, the yeah. impact well, that would have. Have uh, <laughs> well, they, they say they'll kill up to 20 deer. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, they really kill a lot of fawns in the mm -hmm. spring. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. I think we have a bear issue now in Vermont. Bear. Yeah, bear. Um, I have a biologist friend that's in Massachusetts, and we we're talking about that type of stuff. And he said they radio collared some fawns, and um, they found out bear were killing more fawns yeah. than coyotes, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and bobcats were killing a lot too. Yeah. So what they found was um, a bear when in, in the spring when it's a brand new fawn and the fawn just sits there for the first few weeks they don't run and so a bear will just be a lot more methodical they'll just do a little grid and go back and forth where the coyote might not so mm -hmm. so the the very first fawns are really get wiped out by the bears interesting okay. yeah huh. yeah it seems like we i know in the area that i'm at in vermont we have a ton of bear right now nobody's really hunting them either 
Yeah, I mean, you get into uh, late summer, then the coyotes are probably killing more than a bear. But yeah. it's just the they're smarter. They're and really and fawns out. do have a scent to them. They say, oh, they yeah. don't. They do have a scent to them. So they get close and wind them and yeah, find them. They just, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Well, okay. now that we kind of talked about the differences of what you think between Vermont and Hampshire, I know you do a, a good bit of managing kind of the areas that you hunt. How do you go about, like, managing your areas in Vermont? Because, like you've told us before, you're killing, you know, an average five and a half to six and a half year old deer in Vermont, which isn't easy to do. Do you go to a, uh, a different style of management in the areas that you hunt in Vermont? Or is it, how do, how do you go about killing Is it the same those? as well, you, what you do in New Hampshire? Yeah. You exactly. can't shoot a nine and a half year old buck if you shoot a spike horn or three pointer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like in New Hampshire, I may see 15 to 20 bucks a year. Mm -hmm. And it's easy because I know I'm going to see a big buck. If, I mean, if someone's hunting for five years and they haven't seen a buck and they finally see one, shoot it. You know, yeah. we all like to eat, but you're not going to get it on my property. So on, on my properties, New Hampshire, Vermont, it has to be at least an eight-pointer with a spread past the ears. I was talking to a guy the other day, and he showed me a picture of a ten-pointer he got in New Hampshire, and it weighed 115 pounds, and he was so proud of that. That was a year-and-a-half-old buck that would have been a boon crock in two years that genetically really? and I, I oh I, I felt so bad yeah. <laughs> about mm -hmm. that but um, I um, I have time to hunt um, so um, I'm, I'm blessed I so I know I if I try hard if I try a lot harder if it makes it a little bit easier I do whatever it takes yeah but um so I'm mostly a stand hunter. I've shot deer always. I've tracked and shot bucks in New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine. And I've shot them st still hunting and rattling and, you know, all the different ways. But the older I get, the more I sit. Um, hunting in Saskatchewan for 20 years, it just, it, it toughened me to sit all day because, um, the world record could walk in front of you any time. So I've learned how to dress properly mm -hmm. and just sit. And those bucks are coming out at 2 in the afternoon or 11. And in New Hampshire, Vermont, I would always hunt two hours, you know, sit for two hours, walk all day, then sit the last two hours. Yeah. I didn't realize if you just sat there, they'd come out at 11 o'clock. I thought they'd all be sitting there when it's the rut. 10 to 2. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's uh, November 4th or 5th, something like that. For the next week and a half, I'm sitting. Yep. And I'm just waiting and waiting. And even my best stand, I might not see anything for a couple of days. And boom, here it comes. So you just have to, you know. You have to have confidence in that area you're in. Yeah. That's, that's huge. And uh, so, like, most of, uh, you know, 99% of stand hunting is sitting in the right place. If you're sitting in a, a dumb place, good luck. Yeah. So um, I hunt pinch points. I, mm -hmm. uh, as a land surveyor, I know how to read a map. I could I fi find them before I even get there. Mm -hmm. But I just walk around, walk around, and I'll find where two swamps will come together. Mm -hmm. And just standing there looking at it, it doesn't, it doesn't look special. I, I'm not seeing a bunch of tracks because they might be uh, 100 foot wide with a crossing. They're not leaving a lot of sign, but mm -hmm. I know they're, they have to go through. Mm -hmm. yeah, they have to run the gauntlet. And then I put a camera up and boom. Once I've discovered that's a good stand, I take the camera out of there. Um, big, smart deer sometimes don't like cameras. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, My Vermont property... I have a, a pinch point. It's it's just really not fair sitting there. I mean, every year, if I don't get a buck the first day, I get one the second day. And it's just a big cliff on one side. Then on the other side of the cliff, it's just a saddle where they, they come through and you just sit and wait. And my father discovered it about 30 years ago and I've kind of tweaked it. But but I sit there all day. Um, uh, about five years ago, we had a real tough winter and it snowed real deep. It was um, 
the next to the last day of uh, muzzleloader season in December, it, it snowed a whole bunch. Then it, um, then it rained and it froze and it made a crust. So I sat on the stand and I had five deer go by, then nine deer go by, then two deer go by. What's going on here? I wasn't dressed to sit all day. I mean, it's December after the rut. So I walked around. I came back an hour later. As I was getting there, another five deer were going through there. I saw 32 deer in one stand wow. in Vermont. Wow. And what it was, it was a migration. Oh, it had yeah. gotten to be just enough snow. Yep. So there's like, there's a whole bowl there coming out of a five mile radius. Yep. And they'd all come through people probably over there hunting and yeah, no, they already, they're gone. Yeah. So I put a camera up. Well, I actually, I sat there the next day, dark to dark. I saw one deer. So I hit mm. it the right day. Yeah. And of all that 30 deer, there was one spike horn. Mm. So I put a camera there. And when I came back the next spring, I checked it. And several weeks after I put the camera, then the big bucks started going through. They didn't, they didn't have to come through. They, they waited a little longer. They were, they were yeah. big enough. Um, their legs were tall enough. And they yeah. didn't have to come through. They were a little more stubborn than the doe groups. Yeah, they, were just, uh, they could handle yeah. that deep snow in the crust. Um, switching gears a little bit, Roscoe, um, how particular are you with your entrance on these stands that you have? Are you really particular with how you're getting into these places? I am, but sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. So that stand in Vermont, I have to walk right over the main trail. Yeah. And I'm looking that way, and they walk right over it. So I've been lucky with that. Um, I do pay attention to the wind, but the wind comes from eight directions yep. and the deer come from 10 different directions. Yep. So I know which way the wind is. I, I always have milkweed and all that. So I so check the wind. And if I see a deer and it's downwind, I know I just have to be ready to shoot quickly. I don't, I can't just let him, I can't dilly dally and let him work its way. Cause yeah. he's, cause I mean, I'm careful with my scent, but I mean, as I tell people, if you go in the bathroom in your house, then you spray, what do you, what do you smell? You smell crap and spray. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't mask human scent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. I agree with that. I agree with that. Hmm. Yeah. So kind of rolling, uh, so when you're looking at a new spot as far as trail cameras are, are you always looking at like geological features or are you kind of looking for scrapes and stuff as well when you're setting cameras? Yeah, I'll put them on straight, scrape some, and, and you'll get the little buck at the, at it, and the big ones at, at a, a rub. I mean, if it's a giant rub, it's probably a big buck ripped it up. But yeah, then I'll get a picture of a spike horn just checking it out too. I've made mock scrapes. I haven't had a lot of luck with it, but it's just, you know, it's just a, something fun to do when I check it out. And with my food plots, I'll put cameras on the food plots. Um, I rarely hunt on a food plot. Um, the food plot just gives the deer nutrition and it kind of keeps them on my property more. Mm -hmm. And I'll um, sit on a pinch point and they're going from the, the thick, nasty stuff that I make go by me on their way to the food plot. Um, uh, having a forestry degree, I know what trees to cut to help the tree help the forest and I mean if it's a, a fork maple all these branches come out I'll just cut it down and make a make a mess um, if it's so messy you don't want to walk in it boy the deer are gonna like it so I've turned some of my properties into that and I mean in my Vermont land I've made some good habitat there too I I um, favor the oaks I and my neighbors are cutting the oaks down while I'm not. It's, it's money in the bank. Mm -hmm. Let the trees grow more. They're getting bigger. And I got the acorns. Yep. Mm -hmm. hmm. If you have the acorns, you got the deer. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. If everybody has acorns, yeah. then, you know, good luck. So I, I have more acorns. Yeah, I've actually, um, I've talked to a guy down in, uh, he lives in Georgia, in the mountains. And he says everything's oak down there. Like these big mountains are just covered in oaks. And he says 
it's impossible to pattern the deer because there's just everywhere they go, they have feed. But yeah. which we're actually kind of lucky in the Northeast where we can narrow it down. Yeah. You know? Well, when you have a really good acorn crop and you have food plots, good luck because the deer prefer acorns over food plots. So yeah. I like bad acorn years. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you do. Yeah. 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 Do you have acorns up in your uh, Vermont spot as well or more down this way? Uh, I, I'm in the Connecticut River Valley up there and I got beautiful veneer quality oak really okay. big and we had a lot of acorns this year down here in uh, rockingham county new hampshire we didn't have any acorns really yeah so. do you have a lot of white oak around here um, i own a, a mountain of white oak down here yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's maybe like a six year rotation of a good year but when we have uh, a good white oak year the the bear i mean everything's in there just gobbling it right up it just sucks all the wildlife right in huh yeah it's just twice as much nutrient and mm -hmm. they're not they don't have the tannins so they're not bitter to the taste so 